Andrew, thank you very much. And can I say uh, good afternoon to everybody. The reason you need to understand I'm as informally dressed as I am is uh, Andrew explained that I'm a local boy. I came here at 10 o'clock this morning to make sure the room was set up. Um, and I didn't manage to get home and change again. And therefore I'm more informally dressed uh, than I had to, uh, intended to, uh, to do. It was on the 3rd of June, 1929, when this city was proclaimed a city. And various dignitaries uh, were invited to uh, an occasion which uh, occurred outdoors in June in 1929. As you can see, it was a day that had a little bit of rain, maybe not as much as today, but enough that the uh, the governor needed an umbrella over his feathers. And it was an occasion when the city fathers, because there were no city mothers in those days, the city fathers chose to have an event in the town hall that involved no alcohol at all. And it did involve a very large number of speeches. And it was that night, after an afternoon of, of speeches, that uh, one of the parliamentary dignitaries recorded in his diary that uh, these sorts of occasions, cold weather, ginger ale, and long-winded speeches are not a contribution calculated to arouse the pioneers to enthusiasm. <laughs> the assistance of today's wine sponsor, I assure you I will do my best to not make the same mistake today. When I told a friend that uh, I was going to talk about the future of Fremantle, this friend suggested to me that the future of Fremantle is an oxymoron. That we in Fremantle are much better at talking about our past than we are about our future. But the pride that we have in where we have been and what we have done, which is immense, is not always equal by our capacity to talk about where we are going to from here. The same friend suggested to me that nothing much has happened in Fremantle since the America's Cup, and that was 25 years ago, and we lost it anyway. And he suggested that Fremantle is a little bit bohemian, for his taste, a little bit too hippie, to use the phrase that he used unkindly in our discussion. So therefore, somewhat defiantly, I've chosen as my topic something which has a hint of the patchouli oil in it, I suppose, by choosing something from J.R. Uh, Tolkien about rings that bind us. In choosing to talk about one ring to bind them, I want, please, to avoid any controversy about the identity of Fremantle's three elven kings or its seven dwarf lords, and particularly, Mr. Mayor, anything to do with the Dark Lord of Mordor. <laughs> talk about this little part of our city, little because it's about two kilometres by two kilometres, it's about four kilometres square. I think the most important and often the hardest thing about the revitalisation and the regeneration, in my experience, of any city or town on the planet are those to do with the issue of place. Place. The assemblage of activities, social, emotional, sensual, spiritual experiences. If a place doesn't have place, it's an exceptionally difficult thing to create it. To create it simply by decisions, expenditures, policies, machineries that say we shall create a place, let's make it happen. It does happen. It's very hard. And every great city that I can think of, I suggest, comprises a variety of discrete, interlocking, activity places. 
each of those activity places has its own character, its own offerings. Each is able to sustain an interest and an element of surprise. Fremantle, you know, is blessed with a variety and power of activity places that would be the envy of virtually every city and town in this nation. All of these in an area of about two kilometres by two kilometres. Let me look at them with you. Let me call them activity rings and don't please get too fussed about precisely where I draw each of these rings. It probably says more about my capacity with PowerPoint than anything specifically about the boundaries of these, uh, of these rings. Uh, but I think, nonetheless, they can make my points uh, clearly enough. The first activity centre, the first activity ring that exists here in Fremantle is the West End. And it's said, and I have no reason to disagree, that it is the best preserved Victorian port on the planet. And it carries with it a glory of architecture and of space and of activity that any of us, as we move uh, on any fine day uh, through the West End, can see people standing in admiration and awe of, and those of us who live with it, and in my case, I live in it, uh, we take immense pleasure and pride in that particular activity. We, I guess in certain ways, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site crying out for recognition. The second of those activity rings that we have to bless us here in Fremantle is the Cafe and Leisure activity ring. It includes the Cappuccino Strip, home of the Bulldogs, I hope the new home of the Doctors, the nightclubs, the various breweries and pubs, cafes, restaurants, the market, the esplanade, the inland side, the fishing boat harbour, uh, a density of activity and interest that draws people uh, by day and by night and at weekends. The third activity ring that we are blessed with in this small area is the port and the waterfront. To live with the ever-changing economic activities of a port, to have them as part of our existence, to relate to them and with them, to have as our raison d'etre, and indeed their raison d'etre, an association and a relationship, is an immensely powerful activity circle. Fremantle Inner Harbour is not Disney, it's not a creation, it's an active, industrial, progressive, prospering port carrying something in excess of 500,000 containers a year, growing at something like 7.5% per annum, and projected to increase that significantly, and as we heard or read recently, affirmed by the government as having a long-term future as an inner harbour as part of the city. Fourth of the activity rings that we live with is what I'll call our seafront. And sometimes I think we forget that entire line, that continuum of what represents our seafront. If we go at one extreme from that green lighthouse that CY O'Connor put on the end of South Mole with the intention of being operating as a lighthouse, uh, and it failed and became simply a green navigation light through past the submarine cable arrangements which are still there, the gun emplacements, the maritime museum, the place where the Union Jack was placed to begin colonisation of Western Australia, through Bathers Beach, through Muse Road, past the uh, place where uh, uh, the America's Cup occurred, the place where the yachting championships will occur, an immensely important piece of seafront 
as important and as dense and as interesting and as active as any piece of seafront along the broad coast of Western Australia. My involvement in the regeneration of other urban areas through the years has taught me the immense difficulties of building and sustaining authentic, unique, attractive, significant, recognisable, identifiable, activity attracting precincts. We have four which are as powerful as most such activity circles that any place, as I say, has in Western Australia and the end of most. You're asking yourself though, what about the fifth? Because there is, of course, a fifth activity centre. And that's our central city. Truly, I think it is the most worrisome of our five activity centres. Each of those other four we recognise to fair measure. Each of those other four provide immense opportunities for us to continue to build in the future and to grow and develop with them as part of our identity in Fremantle. But our central city looks sometimes like half a catchment at the end of the road. And it's one that the economic development strategy of the uh, city, which has been spoken about at a previous leader's lunch, and which has been considered and supported by our council, has said, and I quote from page one of the strategy, in the last decade, the city's economic vital signs have been stagnating. And city central is at the center of the stagnation. But it needs an intensity of activity and a certain future is undeniable, I think, to everybody in this room however they come at it. It will require significant changes, in my view, to succeed. And in my view, significant changes have begun. Those challenges are accentuated, I think, by a number of things at the same time. Let me just mention some of them. I think one is the parlous condition of retailing nationally that we are not the only fish in that particular ocean, although we are certainly struggling with our issues in relation to retail. It's probably not helped in certain cases by the shabby condition of some of our buildings, and I look forward to a repaint of our town hall as part of that. I think it's not helped by the impending expiry of certain key leases in our central city, it's not helped by the proclivity of some of our shops may be to make offerings that concentrate on the cheap and ephemeral end of the market. And I suppose we have our share of social and behavioural problems in our city centre, both in the day and at night. But I put to you that that ring, that city ring, is the ring that will bind the other four. And without its success, it's going to be very hard for the city to continue to own and develop, in the appropriate sense, the activities that exist in those other rooms that are so well established. <coughs> the uh, Drivers Activity Centre development in the Fremantle CBD that uh, the uh, Property Council and uh, the City of Erdis put together and has been uh, uh, discussed already at a leader's lunch um, said in its summary of analysis that despite its strong inherent strengths, Fremantle has of late fallen behind other strategic metropolitan centres. In comparison with the Fremantle's deteriorating rapidly, and while possessing substantial historical strengths and potential, Fremantle has come to be perceived as a rigidly controlled locality lacking a clear sense of purpose. 
It suggests as a high priority action that we develop a CBD wide strategy or structure plan. And the CBD was lacking, it suggested, a coherent direction. And the plan required visionary and forward thinking. It talked about the need for the city and the state to work together and support one another. And one of the key points that I will attempt to make in a moment is the urgency and importance of doing just that. That our city has a need at its centre to have the intensity of retail, commercial and residential activity that the future of King's Square, uh, the Woolstore Shopping Centre, the Gas and uh, Coat site and many others are receiving direct, immediate, urgent attention from our city and I acknowledge the work of our Mayor, our councillors and our officers which is making immense and significant progress in this regard. My argument though is that they can't do that alone. And the need for us all in this community to work together and to work with those who have the muscle, interest, authority, power to support us is profoundly important. I suggest to you also that there's a quite narrow time window through which we need to move this collaborative work. Uh, the Director General of Planning Eric Lumsden, who is here with us uh, this afternoon, who he and I talked about the other day, he mentioned that it is quite possible to argue that the city has maybe two years through which it needs to move this significant collaboration. And his point, of course, was that if we don't take that opportunity within a two-year period, there are other cities other parts of the metropolitan region in response to, to Directions 2031 and the opportunities that are before them who will move that far uh, ahead of us that the gap will become greater rather than smaller process. We need a picture that is clear, far-sighted enough for Fremantle's future and we need to do, I suggest, some heavy lifting. Metaphor that I will try on you just for a moment or two and then discard is one that it, uh, is a little bit like a game of billiards. A game of billiards that we need to play over the next couple of years uh, is one that reflects the vast range of involvements and actions that are necessary between us all. And this game of billiards is an elaborately prolonged, complex game with, if you can imagine, a huge number of balls on the table simultaneously. The need to be popped is some sort of intricate sequence by a large number of players, some of whom are expert at the game and some of whom are not so expert, to a set of rules that are not always well understood or agreed, and in the presence of a large and variously interested audience who at any moment might sufficiently lose patience or interest to call the whole thing off and order it to be started again. That one occurred in 1807, I should say. We've got a bigger crowd than they had back in 1807. Before I abandon the metaphor entirely, um, I remind you that billiard tables also featured prominently in our history when uh, C.Y. O'Connor uh, first proposed the development of the port. He had an elaborate model built on a billiard table complete with tanks of water underneath that uh, uh, moved the tides so, uh, backwards and forwards. So we were accustomed, I think, to uh, working with billiard tables and at least C.Y. O'Connor was in the process. <coughs> Three main options that are available to us as we move forward, I put it to you simply as these. Firstly, for us to battle on, as we avowedly are, to work as best we can on the issues in front of us. The second is to install or have installed upon us some benevolent dictator 
who will make it happen regardless. The third option is for us to develop sufficient collaborative grunt between us all to get the game closed. The battle on option, to my mind, has a couple of issues with it, and I suspect with yours as well. Most importantly, I'm not sure of the likelihood of success given the challenges and the urgency, the speed and efficiency with which we can move despite our best efforts and despite the energy and the commitment that is there makes me uncertain indeed that there is any chance of battling on over the time that's available to us. Second option is, as I say, to install some benevolent dictator. It raises, of course, questions as to how one has a voice as a community to that particular benevolent dictator. Benevolent dictator in the sense of some organisation or individual who holds sufficient of the powers to move the city forward. I'm not sure either what the appetite of Fremantle is for benevolent dictators. I don't think we respond generally particularly well to them. And thirdly, there are questions as to exactly what the machine would be to move forward with benevolent dictator. <coughs> one of the arrangements, of course, is the one that you see as Sydney moves its Barangaroo project, its immense Barangaroo project uh, forward uh, under the uh, uh, responsibilities and governance of an organisation whose job it is to make the entire thing occur. The power and muscle involved in that, of course, has its moments, and I don't think Fremantle would have an appetite for a Barangaroo approach. We have some history in Western Australia of the benevolent dictator organisational arrangement uh, through a model called redevelopment authorities. Um, one uh, redevelopment authority, namely the one that Andrew mentioned, I'm associated with uh, EPRA, uh, started originally in the uh, Claysbrook area, uh, amongst other things, with the old gas works at uh, uh, Claysbrook and with a body with statutory planning powers and a fair amount of immunisation from the uh, involvements of uh, other uh, more orthodox uh, planning powers, it moved that situation <coughs> to a whole new world that is Perth. What he's done since then is develop uh, attention for a number of other parts of the city, including the uh, New Northbridge area, which was uh, recently awarded, as some of you might know, uh, the UDIA's uh, National uh, Award for Excellence in Urban uh, Renewal uh, under a master plan that reflected uh, the heritage and values of the area across the north side of the city, and the same project was awarded. Uh, the prestigious UDIA Presence Award, which is selected for the best uh, of the uh, individual uh, developments throughout the nation in relation uh, to uh, urban development. Um, and what's been done in, in uh, New Northbridge, of course, reflects the social and heritage values of that particular place. I've left some uh, copies on the uh, tables of uh, Urbano, which is uh, Epirus magazine, and I don't want to spend uh, more time today talking about the Epra model. What you will be, uh, some of you are aware of, is that last week the government introduced legislation um, which will absorb uh, the East Perth Rebundle Authority and its sisters of Subiaco, uh, Armadale and Midland into a new metropolitan uh, redevelopment authority, uh, which will have broadly similar powers to those uh, which are 
uh, held currently by those redevelopment authorities and will, uh, if it passes through the Parliament um, and uh, um, the government supports it to, to its uh, beginnings, it will occur on the 1st of January uh, next year. And at that point of time, there will be a power for those sorts of redevelopment authorities to be applied to other parts of the metropolitan area, uh, apart from where they are right now. I need to say to you right now, I wouldn't support a redevelopment authority approach to the city. I don't believe we need it. I don't believe the council and the community uh, would find it uh, uh, straightforward to uh, work under those arrangements. I think other steps haven't been tried. I think it would take some time. Uh, I think it would be a dangerous red herring if uh, we went through a process of first waiting for legislation and then trying to convince somebody that is the way to go. I know of no appetite within the government to go in that direction. I don't hear any discussion of Fremantle being part of the uh, redevelopment uh, authorities and structures. And I don't think that is the Fremantle ways at this point of time. What does Maxton, I put to you, is the collaborative grunt the working together in a way which we can do and which some evidence suggests we can do successfully, while other evidence suggests we've made a bit of a meal of it from time to time. To get all the right individuals and organisations and the community together as one raises issues of prioritisation, compromise, raises issues of what I'm calling new imputinisation, which is the business of focusing on little issues rather than the bigger issues of being lost in the detail when we're still not clear in the overall direction where we go. It raises issues of how many players there are and who is accountable for what. And it needs, of course, a machine, some way or another, to bring them together. Great work is being done. The BID model is important, essential the work uh, which uh, the city uh, and its officers are doing, um, moving dramatically in the direction of new approaches to the health and the retail and uh, commercial um, and uh, uh, residential parts of our city, but bringing the involvement of all the others who have their fingers over certain leaders and nods in the sequence of the whole process. There are, I put to you, four significant authorities that need to share the same picture as to where the city is going. If any of those four have a significant different view to the other three, then the process of collaboratively grunting together becomes very, very hard. The four key authorities with planning influence are the city itself, uh, the WAPC and the Department of Planning, the PTA, the Department of Transport, and Fremantle Ports. The IMG development has a lot of learnings for a lot of us in the way that all authorities and the community work together. Uh, and I acknowledge the uh, work that uh, uh, Chris Lee Hayter and uh, uh, Jim Limerick, who are again both here today, and the court are doing to assess those learnings um, and to work with the uh, community productively um, is a way, of course, for us to progress and learn together for the, for the future. One ring to bind the effort of the PTA, the port, planning agencies, and the transport agencies as one will make or break how we can move in the next couple of years. Now, less important, of course, is the availability for that to occur within the binding range ring of sustained, genuine community stakeholder engagement consultation. The role of 
Fremantle Society, the University, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, individuals, individual organisations, of course, is important in the uh, It's not right, I suggest, to say the following things, despite the fact that I hear them regularly. It's not right to say that the city of Fremantle is so frozen by the minutiae of regulations that no self-respecting investor should step within the city's limits. It's not right to say that Fremantle courts are within an inch of wheeling out yet another ING development. It's not right to say the interests of the PTA and the Department of Transport are so focused on cluttering the uh, forecourt of the station with as many buses as they can get there. It's not right to say the WAPC and the Department of Planning has given up on Fremantle in the belief that Directions 2031 and the future of the city is taking focus elsewhere. Despite those sorts of wrong statements, there is an immense interest and support from those agencies to move with us together. And for those, please, who are not aware, you need to know that in this room now with us, are the heads of all those organisations who come here to participate with us in thinking about the future of our city. In the community perceptions survey that Fremantle recently undertook, a statement was put to respondents that the City of Fremantle has developed and communicated a clear vision for the area. And when they answered this, which was uh, more than 12 months ago, only 29% could agree with that statement. And that 29% uh, compares with the average of other cities who were surveyed, which was 40%. And the highest scoring council, which was 64%. And there is, I put to you, or at least has been, a need for people to be clearer than they are right now where our future is headed. As the same survey observed, with just 4% of residents strongly agreeing that the city has developed and promoted a clear vision for the area, there is scope to do more in this area. a range of social, cultural, economic, artistic, historical, heritage drivers of Fremantle's character. And those layers sit, I put to you, over those rings of activity very powerfully. You might have your set, I'm sure you do, of uh, thoughts about what those drivers actually look like, but let me very quickly share with you a couple of them that, 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 that I can see you make a couple of points. Of the first is that Fremantle is and will be a design city. We have actually more architects per square kilometre than anywhere else in Perth. We export their influence. Geoffrey London is the state architect of Victoria. Kieran Wong is the 2010 winner of the Australian Institute of Architects Urban Design Award, not for Fremantle, but for Broome. Kerry Hilton is from Singapore. Josh Byrne has created the wonderful urban orchard and wetland in the heart of Perth's cultural centre. The challenge I put to our friends from the architecture and design world of our city is that they might reconvene their community to consider what the arts, design and architecture can contribute to the reinvigorate freedom. I've spoken to uh, Kira Wong and to Geoffrey London who have both expressed great enthusiasm for that and 
and uh, I look forward to us running a more powerful dialogue in relation to the influence that design has and will have on our city. And we have a moment. The second overlay is we are a young city. Between 2001 and 2006, when West Australia's overall population grew by 157,000 people, we actually had a net loss of 25 to 34 year olds. In a period when this state was growing to the tune of 157,000 people, the number of 25 to 34 year olds with a university degree was actually 3% lower than what it had been in 2001. And during that period, 39% of people who left Perth went to Melbourne, and they went to Melbourne in part because, of course, of what it is that Melbourne represents in terms of the values for young people and the nature of the gritty city. The third layer is that we are the welcome city. Fremantle is an immigrant city. I can argue that it's Australia's immigrant city. Australia's Ellis Island. That Fremantle was the first port of call for the majority of immigrants to Australia. 450,000 of them came through Victoria Key in the middle of the 20th century. And the impact of Italian, Greek and other nationalities has been profound. And whether it's 2,620 people on the QM2, or whether it's Hank from South Australia, we're still a relevant city. We're a history city. As I said, almost buried under the pylons of the Maritime Museum are the remnants of Arthur Head, where Captain Fremantle raised the Union Jack and took possession of all of New Holland that hadn't already been taken from New South Wales. And that our city today overlays very precisely where we come from. We're a creative city. Our museums, our football team, our carnival tradition, publishing companies, music, writers, cinemas, art houses, galleries, architecture and design, as I mentioned. We're a sustainable city. We proclaim ourselves uh, as it. Uh, and we have, of course, a Green State Member of Parliament, uh, a Green Mayor, and many, many of us aspire to seeing the city develop further its sustainable credentials. And within that is the important role played by transport and the aspirations that our city has to make sure that we lead in that area. If I return to my sketch of the five activity rings, I acknowledge to you what you've already noticed. And that is we have a railway station that at this point of time doesn't sit very well within any of those five activity rings. And that is a sensational omission. We have our own celebrated railway line named in the city's honour, and it sits broadly in a sea of bitumen. The only significant occupied building currently within a quarter kilometre of Fremont Railway Station is this one and sits with its back to the city and has even slid up the footpath, it seems. The role of our railway station, Victoria Quay and Central Business District of Fremantle are intertwined in the future, absolutely. The vision that we have of our city and the way it's going from here needs to have, I put to you, a clear picture of how that works. We need 
may lead to redefine the Central Cities Activity Area. I don't know about you, but I stand uh, in great admiration. <laughs> Thank you, PTA, for the work that's been done in doing up our railway station, which looks absolutely glorious. My, my only, I guess, small point to mark is that the former is the wrong colour uh, on top. They would, I think, be black rather than white, but the scaffolding has come down, I fear. Um, but apart from that, I have absolutely no quibble and great praise for the way we have re-established the beauty of our railway station, despite where it sits. For us to find ways of having transit-oriented development in our vision for our future, for us to articulate those clearly, for us to work with those agencies together, for the community to work with, with those together, for us to recognise the importance of non-motorised transport and cycles uh, and uh, pedestrians in the process, for us to grapple with the issues of car parking within our city, to find ways of continuing to embrace the role that water transport uh, plays, not just in a domestic but also in an international uh, sense. For us, uh, and in that time, acknowledge, please, the uh, work that the uh, port has done with uh, B Shed and the new uh, ferry channel, which has great progress in, in that uh, regard as well. So there are, in summary, at least five key activity rings in our city. Four of them are the envy of virtually any place. One of them struggles, it happens to be the most important of all five of them and the one deserving of our attention. Layered over those five activity circles, a range of different characteristics of our city. Ones that look maybe like uh, what I put to you, uh, maybe you would have your own interpretation of uh, what those are. But we agree, I think, that they are strong, powerful, absorbing, interesting, engaging forms of activity in a city which is blessed as strong as it is. Finish with the story of the proclamation tree. 21st of October 1890, when Fremantle was in those days quite clearly the second city of the state, and when Queen Victoria granted responsible government to the colony, and Sir William Robinson, our newly installed governor, uh, proclaimed on the Esplanade in Perth uh, the uh, responsible government on behalf of Her Majesty. Um, Fremantle played a very significant part in that proclamation. What we did as a city centre is make sure that on the second day of festivities the Governor came down on the quite new uh, railway line and a collection of festivities occurred uh, at the railway station. Again, it was a, a day a bit like this, a very blustery one. Um, and uh, for everybody's dismay, our giant triumphal arch at 8 o'clock in the morning was blown over by a gust of wind. And we had three hours to reinstall the triumphal arch before His Excellency arrived, and we did so because we are resourceful. And in the process of being recognised for our particular role, of course, in planting the tree that sits at our gate, our gate at the east end to this uh, day. So the tree's going to sit, it grows continually at uh, our gate. There's much to be done, it's collaborative, there's much to be done to respond to the imperative triggers of the condition in the direction of 2031 and the opportunities they're in. There's much to be done in terms of a consistent and strategic direction which is far-sighted and broad. A 
I'm reluctant to refer to this effort as being a Fremantle alliance because there's a sterling alliance and that will work a different way and that's for their particular world. Sometimes, up seriously, I'm inclined to call it a Fremantle union reflecting our industrial past. Whatever you want to call it, the machine to bring the players together and our community is there for the taking now. The appetite of all those individuals is in place, I believe, now. And we can continue to build on what's been happening in the last uh, couple of years. I acknowledge that here today is a city, a mayor, many of its councillors, and the executive of the city. I acknowledge here today is the Port of Fremantle, the chairman of its board, Jim Limerick, its CEO, Chris Leif Hayter, and many of its executives. I acknowledge that here today is the chairman of the WA Planning Commission, Carrie Prattley, the director general of the Department of Planning, Eric Munson, that the managing director of the PTA, Mark Burgess is here. That Rhys Baldock, the Director General of Transport, is here. John Stratton, the President of the Fremantle Society, is here. Ray Glickman and his board and Peter are here from the Chamber of Commerce. The Land Corp is here, represented by Ross Holt, its CEO. The Land Corp are important partners and willing participants in the future of Fremantle, as Ross uh, uh, reaffirms again uh, today. And that the things are in place and the opportunities are there like they never have been, to my knowledge, before. And Fremantle, we can do this.